Hi, everybody. This is Paul Fremantle, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a project called Celery. And Celery is designed to help you build composite apps on Kubernetes and manage them. Um, and hopefully, it's going to be a fun webinar. I'm going to try and do a live demo. Uh, as you may guess, that has its dangers, and it may well go horribly wrong. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to do a very quick overview of what's going on here and show you a little bit about Celery. And then we're going to dive straight in the demo. Then I'm going to do a bit more explanation, show you a second demo, and we'll kind of take it like that. So uh, we all know that microservices and services, serverless applications are becoming the norm. And so these kind of applications where we build small network connected services and then we containerize them and we deploy them in a container orchestration system are very popular. And the reason why is they give us all kinds of benefits for scalability and agility. But there are some challenges. And one of those challenges is just the complexity of deploying complex applications. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit more. Um, and certainly, Kubernetes is becoming the de facto uh, deployment infrastructure for these cloud native apps. And Kubernetes gives us this ability to take what, what they describe as this ocean of user containers and deploy them uh, dynamically uh, and in a flexible way onto a cluster of systems. And some people have called this a cluster operating system. That's a contentious term, but I, I kind of like the analogy, if, you, if you're willing to accept that as an analogy. And, and We've seen almost every vendor of uh, large scale infrastructure and cloud uh, move to support Kubernetes. Obviously, Google is doing it, but Pivotal Container Service is now based on Kubernetes. Amazon has their EKS, OpenShift, uh, Azure, DigitalOcean, VMware. And so we believe this is a, a kind of prime target for this kind of uh, tool. And you know, here's you know, here's a quote from uh, Craig McClucky saying Kubernetes is all the standard basis for deploying distributed software. But I think what also clear is that Kubernetes is 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 kind of like Linux was 20 years ago that it's still in the early days and we're going to see add-ons uh, extensions and components that help you manage, deploy, control, and monitor applications on, on Kubernetes. And that's really the basis on which uh, Celery is built. So Celery is an open source project. It's in GitHub. And uh, there's a, a fairly short, simple web page trying to explain it. So I suggest you, you know, if you want more information, you go to one of those pages. Uh, you can download it. And everything I've done here is, is pretty straightforward. I'm just doing the kind of basic samples for the demo and trying to explain them in that sense. And so what have I pre-installed and configured? So I've installed the Celery 0 0.3 runtime on my machine. It's a pretty small download. It's 18 meg. And it uh, requires you to have uh, Docker. And it also requires you to have access to a Kubernetes cluster. Now, that could be running locally in VirtualBox. Uh, so if you have VirtualBox, you can install it locally. Or you can have a, a existing Kubernetes cluster. Or if you have Google Cloud, uh, you can put your credentials uh, in a place where Celery can access them and then it can install there. I'm also using a Visual Studio Code for editing. And Celery today uses Ballerina as its, uh, as its language, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Um, 
but if you want VS Code syntax editing, then it helps to download and install Ballerina as well. And I've also set up some host names and so forth in etc. hosts. So pretty simple setup. Um, fingers crossed that it works. And I'm running this on Google uh, Compute today. And so earlier in the day, I did a Celery setup. And this basically goes and creates a Google Kubernetes engine cluster. It goes and sets up a, a, a SQL instance, which is used for some of the other pieces, and an NFS server, which is used for a bit of file system, and deploys Celery. And it also deploys Istio, and which is a service mesh, and something called Knative Serving, which helps us do uh, serverless support. And now, not all of those are required. You can do a basic install that doesn't have all those components. Uh, but I thought I'd just do the full install. And that takes around 10 minutes, including launching the Kubernetes cluster. If you already have a Kubernetes cluster in place, then it's a little quicker. As I said before, there are these options to install on an existing Kubernetes cluster or, on, or use VirtualBox. So that's what I've done. And you can see there's, I have a Kubernetes cluster. I just did a screenshot from Google Cloud Platform. And I'm just going to do a really simple hello world. And so uh, let me switch over to a command line and enlarge that. And hopefully you can read that. Let me enlarge my font a little bit. And I'm going to uh, make a directory called, um, in fact, I'm going to switch to the webinar directory. And I probably did this already. Oh, no, that's the wrong directory. Ah, the first curse of live demo. There we go. And I did this already, so I'm just going to delete what I did before. And I'm going to type celery in it. And that's going to create me a new project. And I'm going to call the project hello. And if I go to the hello directory, you will see it's created a ballerina file. So ballerina is a language. and and it's a fairly simple, straightforward language. It has some heritage in, in Java, JavaScript, and, and, and so forth. Um, and instead of using YAML to configure our Kubernetes applications, we're going to use this Ballerina language. And so I'm going to just do code hello val and show you what that looks like. And what we have here is we basically have two functions a build function and a run function. And so what we're going to do is we're going to build a cell image. And that cell image is going to be something that we can deploy. And in this case, it's really simple. We have one pre-existing Docker uh, container, uh, which is basically a simple Hello World web app. And it's written in Node.js. And it exposes a uh, web UI in port 80. And we want to put that out and through our through our gateway as hello world.com with a context of slash. And this uh, pre-existing container has has an environment variable that it that it wants to be set called hello name. And the default value of that is celery. And we are creating this concept of a new composite, which we call a cell. And that composite has just one component in it, which is this container. And so we're going to go and create that image uh, with, that contain with, that, with that single composite. And then the run is going to go and find that cell and just check if you want to overwrite that vhost or hello name. And if you do, if you set those in your in your environment, then it's going to overwrite them, and then it's going to create the instance. So this is some simple code that's going to help us build a, a construct. And of course, it's far too simple a an example to be much use. Um, but it's so so our hello cell really is is pretty basic. It has just the one 
container in it, hello, and it has a web gateway exposing that out to the rest of the world. But even so, I just want to show you one of some of the reasons why code is a good idea here. So, for example, this is a a type safe language. So this component type has a set of settings on it. So if I go here and I hit Control Space, the uh, editor knows what those uh, dependents, what those things could be. So it says, ah, you can add a set of replicas. And then I can basically say I want two replicas for this. So this, the fact is a type safe system is kind of handy. This components list here is a map of uh, components. And if I go uh, component two, colon, and I do um, hello cell, I'm going to get a syntax error saying it's an incompatible type. In fact, I'm getting two set syntax errors. One saying it's self-reference, which you can't do, and the second saying it should be a component, but I found an image. So type safety is a really useful aspect of uh, languages as opposed to YAML. And the fact is, because this ballerina language already has a VS Code and an IntelliJ editor, then we get all that benefit as we're, as we're editing this. So I'm just going to switch back to my window, and I'm going to do a celery build on that. And so I'm going to build this hello bow, and I'm going to give it an image name. And this image name is uh, has the same syntax as a Docker image name. And that's kind of important, and I'll explain why in a second. So that's going to go and build this image. And now it says you can run that image. But before I run it, I actually want to show you something. I, I want to do a push on that. So. So just like Docker images, these can be pushed to a registry. And you can actually push these into Docker Hub. There is also a, uh, if I open up, um, this, there's also a, a Celery Hub. And the reason we have a Celery Hub as well as a Docker Hub is if I sign into this uh, GitHub, you'll see that I just pushed that uh, hello image. And we can do things like show you that picture. So we can show you that uh, generated image of what the cell is. And we can say, ah, here's the thing to run this. So that's actually showing me a command I can copy to run that. And if I do that, if I paste that, then um, that's now going to go and run this image. And it's going to give the instance of that running image, hello inst, and I'm going to say yes and go and start that. So, so what we're showing here is that we created a simple composite, and, and this is a pretty useless one. It's only got one instance in it. It may not be worth it, but we can now deploy that in Kubernetes as this concept of a cell. And I'm going to explain why in a, in a minute why we have this cell concept. Now, one of the nice things about this, if I go to another window and um, just enlarge the font there, Sorry, hold on. Uh, if I pull up a tool like K9S, then you can see that this is just a uh, a Kubernetes deployment running. So what have we got here? We've got the actual deployment of the component that we wrote, and then we have a, a, a secure token service, which is not used in this case. We haven't secured this, but it, we'll show you that in a second. And we have a gateway deployment, which is, which is a, a front-end gateway that is going to enable anything there. And I can also uh, go and have a look at cells in K9S, and it shows me it's ready. 
So let me just kill that window and go back to the main window. So, and I can also do, so I can do celery list instances and I can show me that, but I can also do kubectl get cells. And the reason this works is that we have written a thing called a CRD, uh, which is basically an extension to Kubernetes, which defines the concept of a cell as an idea in Kubernetes. And what I'm hoping is that I have set, set up my DNS correctly. So if I go to helloworld.com, there it is, it's running. So there's my basic example, not very cool, but still useful just to see how the basics work. So what have I showed you there? I've showed you celery init, build, push, run, list instances, and get cells. So what I want to do is just explain why we have this idea of a cell and what's really going on there. But before I do that, Let's talk quickly about why code first is important. So type safety and validation, I think, are really valuable. This idea that we're compiling these definitions into immutable images and the ability to push and pull them is, of course, you have that with Docker, but you don't have that with, uh, with higher level constructs. And that, I think, is really important, is this idea that a set of containers that work together become a simple construct. You can also do simple logic during build and run. I showed you some very simple things like lookup environment variables, string manipulation, common functions. And, and we can go a step further and we can also build test suites as well, which I'll show you in a minute. And I showed you the syntax highlighting, the tab completion, the code. And fundamentally, this is much more compact than the equivalent YAML that you use with Kubernetes. So why this idea of a cell? So this is a, a blog that Uber posted back in 2016, saying they just started their, their journey towards the microservices architecture. And back in 2016, they built several hundred microservices and counting. Earlier this year, they put up this graph at a, at a conference, which is their microservice graph. And as you can see there, there are several thousand microservices and, and counting. And it's not just the number of microservices in this chart, it's the point to point connections. It's the lines that are the kind of scary aspect of this because there are many to many lines going all across this chart. And what that tells me is that there may be a governance issue here for managing dependencies of microservices. Now, I don't know anything about Uber's internal systems, but I do have customers who have got to several hundred microservices and, and uh, others who've got towards a thousand, and they certainly are already beginning to find massive challenges in cataloging, understanding, knowing what those microservices are, and, and being able to find them and manage them. And so that's where the context that we get from things like domain-driven design, we get these ideas of bounded contexts and aggregates, which were designed back in the uh, late 90s to help us deal with OO problems. How do we, how do we manage large-scale object orientation? And about two years ago, uh, Asanka and I started trying to build a model or a, an approach a theoretical approach that said maybe there's a, a equivalent of those of those concepts in domain driven design in a microservices and serverless architecture. And we built this architecture for digital enterprises and modern application logic, which is basically based on the idea that we take a whole set of related services, a domain, a bounded context, and we wrap them up into a cell with a well defined gateway and a well-defined interface, so a well-defined set of swagger or, or APIs or protobufs that define how that cell talks to the rest of the world and everything else is hidden. And this is, you know, this, this paper has been, you know, read and, and commented on and, and it's on GitHub, you can add your own pull requests and we've had several contributions. And it's gone down very well, but the biggest thing we got from everybody was saying, well, I understand this, but how do I implement this? And that's really where 
about six months ago, uh, maybe I guess it was more like eight months ago, we started uh, really working on Celery as a project to deal with this. So what's a cell in Celery? It's an immutable application component that's made up of multiple containers, services with APIs, a trust domain, some policies, and well-defined external dependencies. And it's built, deployed, and updated, and managed as a complete unit. And the idea is that these are reusable units of architecture. So this second demonstration is going to show a much more useful concept of a set of cells. So here, we've got a pet store. And the pet store has a back end, which has four different uh, services in it. There's the catalog, the customers, and the order. And then there's a controller service, which offers an API to those other services and basically coordinates amongst them. And the key point here is if you look at this diagram, no one can call the catalog directly or the customers directly or the orders directly. You have to go through that controller because that's the way the logic was designed by the team that built the back end. And then there's a front end, which is a web portal built in React uh, that calls that uh, controller, that API, and it calls it through a well-defined swagger. So there's a clearly defined open API specification uh, for that controller. And the dependency is from cell to cell is on that well-defined API. And that means that we can change that backend cell, we can reload it, we can deploy it, we can do blue-green and so forth across it. And then the front end, this time, has a single sign-on gateway as well. So we're not just doing an insecure. We're actually doing single sign-on. We're taking an OIDC, open I, I, you know, a OpenID Connect token, doing the login to the portal. And then we're transferring that token and turning it into a JWT token that is used to call the gateway so the back end knows who we are. So there's a lot more going on here. Uh, and I think this is pretty cool. So I'm just going to switch back and firstly go to the back end. And uh, you can see I've got a, another pet back end ballerina file here. And uh, it's a little more complex this time. Uh, it now has three functions in it it has a build, run, and test. And the build is very similar to the last one. So we've got the order service, the customer service, the catalog service, all defined as internals. The difference now is we've got this controller component, and this now has is exposed outside the cell, and it uses this JSON swagger. And it has a set of environment variables that are used to link it to those other dependencies, and we have a dependency here which says this depends on the catalog orders and customers component. And what that does is make sure that those are started up in that order before we start up the uh, controller component. And then the, the run function uh, is just as before, but this time we've also got a test function. And what the test function basically does is what we've defined is a, another Docker container that has a set of tests against that backend. And what this does is basically say, we're going to uh, run that, uh, run the, the, the cell, then we're going to run the test suite, and then we're going to stop the instances. And this is going to capture all the logs from that test suite and make them available to us. So this is, this is kind of really treating this component as part of a of an ongoing, uh, ongoing CI/CD process where we're going to test it as part of its thing. So I'm going to uh, do the same thing. I'm going to build that as I did before. Be and I'm going to call it Fusit Frio slash Pet Be 0.3.0. And I, I want to make an interesting point here, which is that all those backend containers. Uh, were written in, if I, if, if I go to the, the code, you'll see, they're all written in Node.js. So although the definition of this cell is written in Ballerina, none of the actual application code is written in Ballerina. Now, of course, 
uh, you can do that. I'm not saying that that Valerina is a great language for, for example, writing that controller in. Uh, but it's these two things are loosely coupled. You can use Ballerina without Celery, and you can use Celery without Ballerina, apart from those those one files, uh, which defines the cell. And I just want to show you uh, this uh, this thing, which is a Celery view. And basically, this is an auto-generated view of that cell. So you can see this is a. It's not quite as pretty as the uh, picture that we saw, the hand-drawn picture that I had in my presentation. But what's really cool is that this is self-documenting. So you can see that the gateway calls the controller, the controller calls customers, orders, and catalog, and only the controller is available at the gateway. So, and this HTTP basically says that this is a HTTP J, uh, Swagger API that's open at the, at the, at the gateway. So if I now go and to look at the front end, uh, the front end again has a, a build and, and run. And the front end build is, is basically the same. The only thing that's different is this time we've said we want to have an OIDC login for this. So that was different from before. And we also have some environment variables saying that we are talking to another cell so we're basically talking to the pet store uh, cell url and that needs to be configured into the gate into the controller uh, container and there's a cell dependency here this time which is that we have a dependency to that pz Frio pet be version 98 and um so then when we do the run we have a slightly more co complex configuration because at runtime, we need to find the right back end to link this to. So effectively, there's a cell to cell linkage going on through something we call a cell reference. And also we need to provide some configuration for that OIDC configuration. So that's basically telling, telling us what, how to talk to the OIDC container. All right, so now I'm gonna uh, Celery build the uh, front end this time. The Frio slash pet front end 0 0.3.0. And I'm going to, uh, in fact, I'm gonna run this now and I'm going to run it. This is slightly more complicated because what we're doing here this time is that we're going to run that uh, just before, just as before. The, we're going to run the pet front end and we're going to give it a name pet front end of the instance. And it has a a requirement to talk to the pet store backend. And we want to call that instance the pet backend. And this time we want to do something called start dependencies. So there's two ways I could do this. I could have the team that owns that backend start and run their own version. And in a production scenario, that's what we'd imagine. That's how microservices work. The team that builds it, owns it, and runs it. And so in that case, we would have a dependency, a linkage either to us or either to a API gateway or to the cell uh, that's already running. But you know, this is more of a developer scenario. I want to run both of these. And so what it's doing is it's basically uh, going and saying, well, I need to have this back end, the front end and the dependencies and, and set it all up. And I did one more thing this time, which I think is really cool. I did that run minus V. And what this does is it's basically does verbose output. And so this actually tells you what is happening with kubectl. So this is basically saying I'm going to go and 
It's done a kubectl get cells to find out information about the front end. It's done a kubectl to get information about the back end. And now I'm going to start that up. It's going to show you the kubectl for the other components as well. Now, this is going to take a little bit longer. Um, so while it does that, I'm just going to um, start up a new window and just show you the view of the front end as well. So effectively, it has to start the back end cell up, wait to see if it's running, and then start the front end. And here now I have the cell documentation for the for the uh, front end, which says I just have this one portal component that is calling to the pet store back end. What's kind of cool is I can actually follow that. So now I can see that the pet's front end is calling to the gateway, the gateway is calling to the controller, and so forth. So I can switch between these because they're both in the repository and the cell documentation has linked it up. So the the team there has done a really nice job on the on the on the um, on the self-documenting aspect of this. So uh, I just want to show you uh, again we can uh, wrong window. I can again we can use uh, k9s. If you don't know k9s it's a really nice little tool that gives you a sort of live view of your Kubernetes cluster in a console. And you can see that it's just starting up the back end gateway service. Um, and that's not ready yet. So uh, that's ready now. And you can see the various services starting up there. So we'll just give it a minute. And there's the front end is now starting. So that's uh, hopefully it'll all be running in a second. So let me just recap where we're at. We've shown how we can build a simple composite with just one container in it. And then we've built a more complex uh, pair of composites, a pair of cells, one with four containers in it with a real backend service and one with a web front end. And we've linked those two cells together in a, in a more interesting architecture. So hopefully now you can see why this is designed to help companies that have hundreds or more microservices because you can group those microservices into units that are more that are more effective that are more based around a a domain in a in a bounded context in domain driven design but our aim and and this is a tough aim is that we want this to be useful even if you only have a few microservices so we think that just being able to build a few microservices into a composite using code instead of config and being able to uh, build these and push these constructs and, and i'll show you some of the other things are valuable even if you only have five or ten microservices now that's hard it's hard to solve both those problems at once and i'd really value your feedback uh, whether we're getting that balance right of, of providing a useful capability for for uh, someone who's growing to, to lots of microservices, but still making this easy enough to use if you have a few. And it looks like that is ready. Um, it is. So let's just do a celery list instances. And there they are. And let's go to my web. And now I'm going to go to petstore.com. And with any luck, uh, I'm going to be able to uh, go and buy some things for my pet. Now, I warn you, because this is all running uh, in a in infrastructure I've just installed, there are no certificates. So I'm going to have a few certificate challenges with, with Chrome in a second. And you'll see that. So obviously, I need to sign in. And this is where I get my certificate challenge, because I've just been uh, sent to the IDP, which is over HTTPS. And now I have to um, sign in with a username and password. And I'm going to sign into the IDP. And I basically, this is where the OpenID Connect comes in. It says, do you want to give this site access to your email and profile? And really, it just wants your username. And I say yes. 
And now it's redirecting me back to the pet store and the pet store saying, oh, it's the first time you're here. I'd love you to give me some information. And, and I'm gonna say I have a hamster as a pet. And now I can go and buy some, some items. Now you might say, what's the point of doing this, Paul? The point is I want to just show you a bit of some of the observability and management that we have. And until I uh, do a bit of uh, traffic through this website, you won't be able to see that. So I'm going to go and uh, go to the cart and check out and then go check my orders and go have a look at the order. And so there I have an order. So this, uh, this, was, this infrastructure was all set up kind of nicely. And now I have a uh, part of what we install when you install the full version is this uh, is a observability system that has tracing, monitoring, and metrics for the system. And so what we have now is you can see that uh, there are some cells running in the system. Now, there's the pet front end, the pet back end, there's that hello instance, and then there's this other one. And yes, I did just run one cell before doing the webinar just to check everything was running okay. So that was the one I ran before, uh, before we joined up. Uh, but let's go have a look at this back end. And you can see there's been 33 requests against the back end, and all of them have succeeded. And there's four components in there, the controller, the catalog, and so forth. And I can go and also look at this in a, in a cell view. And I can go and look at the components. And sometimes takes a little time, because this is not, the previous picture I showed you was based on uh, the, the on the design of the cell. This is based on a monitoring system. So this is picking up data live from looking at the system. And so I'm guessing it's just taking a little bit of time. So what I might do is quickly go back to the pet store and uh, just put a few more bits of traffic through there. Um, go and add another. Uh, order in and purchase that because I need to make sure that enough data has got through into the monitoring system. So now I've got two orders. I'll go check that order. Okay. So uh, it's looking like we haven't yet got any data in there. So we'll just give it a minute. Um, oh, I'm wondering if there's a I just need to do a quick refresh of that because we were getting some cell data a second ago and now we've lost it. This is the curse of the live demo. Um, while, I'm, while I'm waiting for that, let me see if I can get any metrics from Grafana because we also have a Grafana system here uh, which is plugged into the system and this is getting metrics from the underlying uh, Kubernetes nodes and pods. And so you can see here some real metrics on my Kubernetes system. So that's at least working. And let me just, uh, sorry, let me just go back and see if we can get some pod metrics. And you can see uh, various uh, CPU usage and so forth for the various pods. Uh, so I can go to my pet front end portal and see that not much has been happening. Um, and I can get all sorts of interesting uh, data from that. So I'm going to try the dashboard one more time. Uh, the team are going to kill me because they do this demo all the time with no problems and it all works beautifully and they're going to be very very disappointed that this is not working um, so that is a a great shame just go and list the instances um, so let me go back to the presentation and we'll come back to that in a minute and see if 
some of the metrics are, are back in place. So what did I do for that demo? Uh, I showed you salary build, I showed you cell references, I showed you the view with a more complex example. I showed you run minus V where we saw the kubectl commands happening. I showed you uh, login and single sign-on and observability. So we have this idea that cells are these self-contained deployable building blocks. And, and I just want to give you an overall picture of what's going on now. So I'm building my cell description and I'm taking on a set of existing containers that already exist and building how they fit together into a, into a composite. And I build that and that creates a cell image, uh, in this case, two cell images. And I push those to the hub and now I can pull those into my Kubernetes environment and I can run them. So I can run my backend cell, my front-end cell, and I have uh, basically a, a, a standard Kubernetes environment, but I've added into that Istio and, and this Celery CRD that defines the cell type. And then I have this management and observability uh, environment that lets me see what's happening with it. And so there are these uh, open source components, the CLI, it's a very small, simple system. The mesh runtime is this extensions to Kubernetes and Istio that extends uh, Kubernetes and Istio to, to deploy this. And then the observability dashboard that I'm having so much trouble with. I also showed you earlier the Celery Hub. Uh, this is our version of a Docker repository, which especially understands the fact that these are cells. However, you can also configure the command line to push and pull from uh, hub.docker and in fact if you use go look at the old point two version that's what it does uh, the observability and visualization you can see some lovely screenshots there well we basically use uh, open tracing and automatically enable observability of your components so you don't have to write any code uh, in your containers to be able to trace them and i am going to try one more time and see if uh, see if I can get this Celery dashboard up and running. And, ah. Nope. It's, looks like I've got a login problem. Maybe I should just try it in a new window. Nope. That's brilliant. <laughs> well, the curse of live demos has really hit me because now I've got an even worse problem than before. And I'm afraid you're just going to have to believe me about the automatic brilliant uh, thing. I've had all sorts of problems in demos before, but this is the first time I've ever had a problem with the observability dashboard. I wanted to explain about how Celery fits with the service mesh. So uh, we chose to, to work with Istio. Istio is uh, probably the most popular service mesh uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem at the moment. And we automatically configure Istio to do all sorts of cool things. Uh, so cell boundaries, so including load balancing across replicas. We do auto scaling. Uh, we do policy support, so you can actually deploy policies in OPA that control access to services. And we do blue-green and canary deployment. So this is a really important point uh, to do with this. And all of this is based on your application architecture. So you are not having to write an Istio YAML and tell Istio how all these things work together because we have those connections defined in the cell definitions and in the cell-to-cell -cell references. So there's two different kinds of update that we support in Celery version 0.3. The first is we offer this uh, capability called Celery Update, which basically will say, I've, I've updated the components, the containers, but the cell shape, the, the composite is still the same. And so I can just do an update and reload uh, the containers uh, with the latest definition. And that's really, that's really nice because it lets me uh, test this really quickly. But we also have a full blue, green, and canary model, which allows you to change over a backend cell without uh, in a live environment. 
So effectively, I'm running my backend cells 100, and then I start 101 up. And then I say, actually, I want to route traffic uh, that was going to the backend 10 uh, to the 101. And I want to basically send 10% of traffic to it. So that's a canary deployment. I'm trying out 10% of traffic on the uh, updated version to see how it performs. And then I can transfer all the traffic over. And that's effectively a blue-green deployment. Now I've moved from blue to green, and then I can terminate the old one. I just want to give you, I'm, I'm, we're doing well for time here, but I'm just going to give you a couple of other examples. So one of the things that Google has is a pretty uh, large, complex uh, sample application for Kubernetes called Hipster Shop. And this is their picture of it. And it has email, payments, checkout, shipping. And this is a polyglot application. All of these are built in different languages in, uh, and deployed as containers with a lot of Kubernetes YAML. Um, and so uh, one of our team called Daki uh, took that and refactored it as a set of cells. And she looked at that and said, well, actually, I think it makes more sense if there's a, a cart cell, a front-end cell, a checkout cell, a product cell, and an advertisement cell. And this was no code changes at all. So this took away the YAML, but did not change any of the containers, any of the code of the core services. And there's a very nice article up on InfoQ that you can read about it with that link. But what's really interesting is that when you did that with Celery, uh, there were half as many lines of code compared to the same YAML to deploy this in Kubernetes. So not only do you get the type checking, the compilation, the extensibility of writing in a language, but you don't have you you get a much more concise, uh, simpler model, and so that means fewer errors and it, it's more visible. And of course, you get self-documentation because you get those beautiful pictures drawn by us. So where are we in the uh, progress of this project? Uh, we launched uh, 0.3 back in July. And that has that API ingresses with Swagger, has web ingresses, it has the SSO, has the deploy and run on Kubernetes with CRDs, uh, the observability. It has an API gateway built into it, an API management system which I didn't demonstrate to you. Uh, the visualization, there are startup checks. There is auto-scaling support, so you can basically deploy an auto-scaling policy, which becomes a horizontal pod auto-scaler for Kubernetes. Uh, K-native support basically adds serverless, so you can define a container and say, when it's not being used, I don't want to have any copies of this, any instances around, and, and when when a request comes in, I'm going to auto deploy this and, and scale it up. Uh, the blue, green, and canary deployment I explained, uh, I showed you the test and those kubectl commands. Uh, we plan another release in October, which is going to add stateful cells. Um, we also want to add a sort of a simpler model called a composite, which is basically like a naked cell. So, in other words, we believe the cell architecture is really important, but you know, some people want to use this without that concept of a cell gateway and so forth. They just want to use it to deploy a, a set of related services uh, as, as a composite. Um, we've done a lot of work on how this fits into, into your existing Kubernetes uh, CI/CD pipelines, but we want to um, we want to predefine some of those and, and make some of those available. Um, we also are doing a lot of improvements to the cell testing. We have some other things and some performance improvements that we're building in. Um, and then we have a future plan. We did a bit of a um, we did a bit of a proof of concept whether we could use TypeScript as, as well as Ballerina to define these, and that looks quite plausible. Uh, so if there's demand for that, uh, we'll do that. Um, we're all big Ballerina fans here, but uh, not everyone knows about the language, so it might be useful to have TypeScript as well. Uh, we certainly want to enhance the capabilities of that Celery Hub uh, to do more useful things. 
Uh, we've been looking at the service mesh interface, which is a new specification, which might let us allow us to use uh, other service meshes apart from Istio here. And one of the things we noticed during that hipster shop example is that, you know, at some point you want to build an a application and define a, an application that's made up of, say, four or five cells and deploy that as a single unit. So we'll probably define that as well. And, and we really like to hear input from people trying this out, using it, feedback, and see what should go in the roadmap. We're very, very open to those ideas. How do you get involved? Um, you can download and try it uh, from GitHub. Obviously, we'd love you to uh, fork it, provide pull requests, star it. Uh, there's a mailing list, which is uh, still quite quiet, but hopefully we'll, we'll start, and uh, we'd love to see contributions as well. So I just want to summarize with, you know, why Celery? I, I think the code completion validation is, is much better than YAML. Uh, visualization and self-documentation is very cool. This API-centric architecture, I think, is absolutely essential. Uh, and um, I think it's really important to building a scalable architecture in a microservices world. Uh, the security enablement that we do uh, all of that was was kind of all that uh, happened just automatically. So those pet front end and pet back end all did it. Uh, a very scalable architecture. Um, and I think to me, what's really interesting is that this these, this concept of a cell becomes something that exists at build, test, run, management. It's not just it's not just something like um, like a Docker compose file, which only lives at, at one point at the at the uh, runtime, or or something that only exists at build time. We think this idea that there's a single concept that exists the whole way through is really really important. So uh, we're very um we're very excited about that. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, hopefully there's some questions. We've got about five minutes left for, for any questions. So the first question is, can we use Java instead of Node.js? Absolutely. So you can write your containers in any language. And, and if you look at that hipster shop article, you'll see that those uh, that the app that was built there is built in multiple languages. It's a polyglot application that uses Node.js and Go and Python and all sorts of stuff. And you can use any language you like to build apps. This is only, uh, we're only concerned with cons how, those, how those applications wire together and how, how you expose APIs. So you can use absolutely any language you like to write your applications with, with Celery. So I hope that's answered your question, Chandra. So, there's a little Q&A button um, which you can use to ask questions and they pop up on my screen. So uh, please go ahead. So here's another great question from Asan. Uh, I hope I pronounced your name right there. How does Celery differ from pods? Pods are also grouping microservices. So this is, this is really interesting and, and we thought a lot about this. So pods, uh, put together a set of microservices that are very closely coupled and live and scale together on the same node. And so our view is that a pod is a very useful construct, but it's a very small construct. I don't think a pod, if I look at that Uber picture and I look at a company that has thousands of microservices, pods are only really helping you uh, deal with a very small part of that problem. So for example, let's suppose we take our customer concept. So we, we're building a customer domain set of microservices uh, for, a, for an organization. And there's going to be maybe a, a, a core customer data service. There's going to be uh, a contact service. There's going to be maybe a recommendation or, or some AI components. There's going to be all sorts of components there, and, and they don't all scale together. You know, some of them are going to be running on hundreds of nodes, and some of them are going to be running on three nodes. And a pod 
basically says you're putting everything together that scales together. So uh, we think that there's a, a bigger level that needs to exist that's higher than a pod uh, that uh, that is but is smaller than a whole cluster. Um, so Lars has asked, can I elaborate a bit on k-native integration? So this is still quite new. Um, we believe that there's more to do with the k-native integration. At the moment, what we've done is basically enable serverless using k-native serving. So what that does is you can mark up a component and say that you want this to scale to zero. And we use k-native serving to manage that and deploy that. And what that does is effectively say that that component will not take any resources when it's when it's not being used and as it's being used um it will uh, it will then get uh, instantiated and then it'll scale back to zero when it when the use goes away uh, but if you have any ideas on further integration we're very interested we think there's a lot more that can be done with k-native with eventing uh with k-native with the workflows and the build and deploy models as well the next question is, can we integrate big data components that comes from Anise? And the answer is yes, but uh, we think there's more we can do to help you. So you can definitely integrate stateful and, and big data components into Celery today. But uh, we think there's a lot of things we can do to help people manage state. Uh, so for example, when you deploy Cassandra in Kubernetes, there are various things you want to do, like you want to say, before I shut down a node, I want to do a node to drain on it. Uh, I want to have each replica have its own, uh, its own data store. And so there are tools in, in, um, in Kubernetes, like uh, persistent volumes, persistent volume claims. And what we're trying to do is to help you uh script and manage that using code so that you can basically say this this component requires a bit of um requires some some state and here's a, here's how i'm going to help configure the persistent volume claim and the right configuration so the answer is yes but we're going to do more and the next question is uh from sharath which is uh, will features like a workflow engine be part of this? So there's two different ways that you do workflow. So one is you might have that controller. That controller component that you saw is effectively implementing a miniature workflow between the orders, the customers, uh, and the catalog. Right. And that's not something that we want to get involved in. So that is where you would deploy a workflow manager engine as a container and then say this is how it wires up to the other components it needs to talk to but there are a second aspect of workflow orchestration which is i want to make sure that when my containers start the right behavior happens i want to uh, be able to run this test at, at start time uh, I want to be able to run a backup at close down time and so forth. And so that kind of workflow logic of the actual orchestration of the system itself, not of the not of the business logic, but the, the cloud orchestration, is something that you can write in Ballerina today. And you could also uh, plug in a workflow engine to help you through the Ballerina code. So that is the, so there are these two different aspects of workflow, I think. And one is something we want to help you with and one is something that we want to you to just deploy as another component inside a cell i hope that's clear so that's all the questions i have so far uh we're out of time as well uh, we've taken the hour up i hope this was a useful webinar uh, i'm i'm madly disappointed that my uh celery uh login didn't work i'm just going to try it one more time uh, the dashboard. No, nope, it's really not going to work, is it? Uh, so I'm going to give up on that and uh, apologize for the live demo. There's one more question that's come in. 
And it's a really good question, actually, from Sharath. Uh, the question is, how do we deal with cyclic dependencies between cells? So uh, I think this is this is a interesting question. We we decided to make the the core feature of this be to only support uh, a directed acyclic graph. So by default, cell to cell references are always a directed acyclic graph. And the reality is that when you want to do uh, cell to cell communications that goes both ways, you probably want to use something like an event bus. You want to use something like RabbitMQ uh, or Kafka as the cell to cell communication mechanism. So in that model, what you would do is you would deploy a cell that was a going to be a messaging cell and that's going to then be connected to by the other things so that is our model the other way you can do this is effectively you can publish all of the cells in a in an api gateway and and configure all the other cells to talk to the api gateway so there are two ways we we support cyclic dependencies but our general feeling is that uh, that you really want to think of it as a set of acyclic dependencies that maybe have dependencies on a shared API gateway or a shared messaging bus. I hope that's useful. And if you if you think we're wrong, um, you know we're, we're we're definitely willing to discuss that because that's one of the things that we had a lot of debate about. Anyway, guys, I really appreciate everyone turning up uh, and engaging so much and staying to the end. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, uh, my email was at these slides are going to go out um, to all the attendees. And my email was at the front. It's paul at wso2.com. You can contact me or you can uh, ask questions on the um, salary mailing list. All right. Take care, guys.